This episode is sponsored by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, and they have over 100,000 titles available for download. Visit audibletrial.com slash the scald circle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. It's time to relax, grab a drink, pull up a chair by the hearth, and have a seat in the Scald Circle to listen to the tale of cunning Iliane from Romanian folklore, as told by Minogan. Before we begin our story, we wanted to remind you that we release new tales for free every week. Our shorter tales release on Wednesdays, and our longer chapter stories release on every other Saturday. Find out where you can hear them on our website at thescaldcircle.com. And be certain to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast app is. That way, you'll never miss out on one of our enchanting tales from around the world. In addition to our reminder, we have some exciting news for the month of July. You've likely noticed that our format sounds a bit different. Not only that, but you may have heard, in addition to our story releases on Wednesdays, we will also now be releasing longer, chapter-length stories on every other Saturday. As if that isn't exciting enough, starting on July 9th, we will begin hosting Fireside Stories with the Scald Circle at 7pm Central Time, every other Thursday. Our Fireside Stories will be a live stream of Casimir and I regaling you with tales that you may have never heard before, along with some of our witty banter. So if you want to experience what a live show from the Scald Circle is like, that may be of interest to you. You can find out more details under the events section on our website. Now then, without further ado, this is Cunning Iliane. Once upon a time, something happened. If it had not happened, it would not be told. There was once an emperor who had three daughters. The oldest was beautiful, the middle one more beautiful, but the youngest, Iliane was so fair that even the sun stopped to gaze at her and admire her charms. One day, the emperor received the news that his neighbor, a mighty monarch, was no longer friendly, but wanted to fight with him on account of a great imperial feud. The emperor consulted the old men of the country, and seeing that there was nothing else to be done, he commanded his valiant soldiers to mount their horses, take their weapons, and prepare for the terrible battle which was about to be fought. Before mounting himself, the emperor called his daughters, addressed a few fatherly, touching words to them, and gave each one a beautiful flower, a merry little bird, and a rosy-cheeked apple. Whoever has her flower wither, her bird mope, or her apple rot, I shall know has not kept her faith, said the wise emperor. Then, mounting his steed, he wished them good health, and set off with his brave soldiers on their toilsome way. When the neighboring emperor's three sons heard the news that the emperor had quitted his home and gone to war, they made an agreement among themselves and sprang on their horses to ride to the palace and vex the monarch by making his three daughters faithless to his trust. The oldest prince, a brave, spirited, handsome fellow, went first to see how matters stood and bring tidings afterward to the others. Three days and three nights the champion stood under the wall, but not one of the girls had appeared at the windows. In the gay dawn of the fourth day, he lost patience, plucked up his courage, and tapped on the oldest princess's window. What, what is it? What is wanted? asked the royal maiden, aroused from her sleep. It is I, little sister, said the prince. I, an emperor's son, have stood under your window three days for love of you. The princess did not even approach the window, but replied in a prudent tone, Go back home by the way you came. May flowers spring up before you and thorns remain behind. After three more days and nights, the prince again knocked on the girl's window. This time the princess approached it and said in a more gentle voice, I told you to go back home by the way you came. May thorns spring up before you and flowers remain behind. Once more, the prince waited three days and three nights under the maiden's window. In the grey dawn of the tenth day, that is, after thrice three days and thrice three nights have passed, he smoothed his hair and for a third time tapped on the window. What is it? Who is it? What is wanted? 
asked the princess, this time somewhat more sternly than before. It is I, little sister, said the prince. For thrice three days I have stood longingly under your window. I would like to see your face, gaze into your eyes, and watch the words flow from your lips. The princess opened the window, glanced angrily at the handsome youth, and said in a scarcely audible voice, I would willingly look into your face and say a word or two to you. But first, go to my younger sister, then come to me. I'll send my younger brother, replied the prince. But give me one kiss to make my way home pleasanter. Almost before he had spoken, he snatched a kiss from the beautiful girl. May no second one fall to your lot, said the princess, wiping her mouth with her embroidered sleeve. Go back home by the way you came. May flowers spring up before you, and flowers remain behind. The prince went back to his brothers and told them all that had happened, and the second took his departure. After the princess stood under the second princess's window nine times nine days and nine times nine nights, and tapped for the ninth time at her window, she opened it and said to him kindly, I would like to look at you and say a word or two to you, but first go to my youngest sister, then come to me. I'll send my youngest brother, said the prince, but give me one kiss that I may hurry the faster. He had scarcely said it when he stole a kiss. May no second one fall to your lot, said the royal maiden too. Go back home by the way you came. May flowers spring up before you, and flowers remain behind. The prince returned to his brothers, told them all that had happened, and for a third time a hero departed, the youngest son. When he reached the palace where the three sisters lived, Iliane was standing at the window, and when she saw him she said merrily, You handsome champion with the royal face, where are you hurrying that you urge on your steed so hotly? When the prince saw Iliana's face and heard Iliana's words, he stopped, gazed at her, and answered boldly, I'm hurrying to the sun, to steal one of its rays, to give to its sister and take her home, where she shall become my bride. Now, little sister, I will stop on my way to look at you, gaze at your radiance of your face, say a word to you, and steal a word in reply. Iliana cleverly answered, if your nature is like your words, if your soul is like your face, proud and beautiful and mild and gentle, I will gladly call you into the house, seat you at a banquet, and give you food and drink and kisses. The prince sprang from his horse as he heard these words, and answered boldly, My nature will be like my speech, my heart like my face. Let me in, seat me at the banquet. You shall never repent it from dawn till nightfall. He had scarcely uttered the words when he leapt upon the window sill, jumped through the window into the room, went through the room to the table, and took his place at the very top where the emperor had sat when he was a bridegroom. Stop, stop, said Iliane. First let me see whether you are what you ought to be, and then we'll talk and begin our lovemaking. Can you make roses grow on burdocks? <laughs> No, said the prince. Then the thistle is your flower, said clever Iliane. Can you make the bat sing in a sweet voice? No, said the prince. The night is your day, said clever Iliane. Can you make apples grow on wolfsbane? That I can, said the prince. Then that shall be your fruit replied the beautiful and cunning Iliane. Sit down at the table. The prince took his place. Ah, but Iliane was indeed cunning Iliane. Ere had he fairly seated himself, he dropped, chair and all, into the deep cellar where the emperor's treasures were kept. Iliane now began to scream, Help! And when all the servants came rushing in to see what had happened, she told them that she had heard a noise and was afraid that someone had got into the cellar to rob the emperor of his treasures. The servants did not waste many words, but instead opened the iron door and went into the cellar, where they found the prince and brought him in disgrace to be sentenced. Iliane 
pronounced judgment. Twelve girls under punishment for some offense were to carry him out of the country. And when they had reached the frontier with him, each one was to give him a kiss. The order was obeyed. When the prince reached home and joined his brothers, he told them the whole story. And after everything had been related, their hearts were filled with rage. So they sent word to the two older princesses that they must arrange to have Iliane go to the three princes' court so they might revenge themselves upon her for the insult she had offered them. When the oldest daughter received this message from the prince, she pretended to be sick, called Iliane to her bedside, and told her that she could not get well unless Iliane brought her something to eat from the prince's kitchen, and told her that she could not get well unless Iliane brought her something to eat from the prince's kitchen. Iliane would have done anything for her sister's sake, so she took a little jog and set off for the court of the three princes, to beg or steal. When she reached the palace, she rushed breathlessly into the kitchen and said to the head cook, For heaven's sake, don't you hear the emperor calling you? Make haste and see what is the matter. The cook took to his heels and ran as fast as he could, as though he had received an imperial command. Iliane, left alone in the kitchen, filled her jug with food, emptied all the dainty dishes that were on the fire upon the floor, and went away. When the princes heard of this insult, they were still more enraged than before, and sent another message to the two sisters and again prepared a revenge. As soon as the second sister received the news, she too pretended to be ill, called Ileane to her bed, and told her that she could not get well unless she tasted the wine in the prince's cellar. Ileane would have done anything for her sister, so she took the little jug and prepared to go again. When she reached the court, she rushed into the cellar and, panting for breath, said to the head butler, For heaven's sake, don't you hear the emperor calling you? Make haste and see what is the matter. The butler took to his heels and ran as if he had received an imperial command. Iliane filled her jug with wine, poured out the rest on the cellar floor, and then hurried home. The princes sent a third message to the two princesses and told them that they must send Iliane in a different way than they had done before. This time, both the princesses feigned ill, called their sister to them, and told her that they could not get well unless Iliane brought them two of the prince's apples. My dear sisters, replied Iliane, I would go through fire and water for you. How much more willingly to the princes? Taking the little jug, she set off to find, seize, and bring back the fruit and save her dear sister's lives. When the youngest prince learned that Iliane was coming to the garden to steal the golden apples, he gave orders that, if groans were heard there, nobody must dare go in, but let the person who was wailing moan in peace. Then he hid huge knives, swords, spears, and many other things in the earth under the tree that bore the golden apples, concealing them so that only the sharp points rose out of the ground. After he had finished, he hid himself in a clump of bushes and waited for Iliane. She came to the gate, and seeing the two huge lions that kept guard there, flung each of them a piece of meat. The lions began to tear it, and the princess went to the apple tree, stepped cautiously between the knives, swords, spears, and other things, and climbed into it. May this do much good, little sister, said the prince. I'm glad to see you in my garden. The pleasure is mine, replied Iliane. Since I have so brave and handsome a prince for my companion, come, climb the tree and help me pick some apples for my dear sisters, who are dangerously ill and have asked for them. The prince wanted nothing better. He meant to pull Iliane from the tree among the knives. You are very kind, Iliane, he replied. Be kinder still, and give me your hand to help me up into the tree. Your plan is wicked, thought Iliane, but it shall work in your own misfortune. She gave him a hand, pulled him up the trunk to the branches, and then let him drop among the knives, swords, spears, and other such things, which had been put there for her own destruction. There you are, she said. Now you will know what you meant to do. The hero with the black sword began to shriek and groan, but nobody came to help him. They left him, according to his own orders, to moan in peace, and he was obliged to bear his terrible sufferings patiently. 
Eliane took her apples, carried them home, gave them to her sisters, and then went back to the imperial palace and told the servants to go and rescue their master from his great danger. The prince, who had been so abominably treated, sent for the most skillful witch in the whole country to come and give him a cure for his wounds. But Iliane, she had gone to the witch first, and offered her a great deal of money to let her, Iliane, go to the court in her place. So Iliane went to the palace disguised as a witch. She ordered a buffalo hide to be soaked in vinegar three days and three nights, then taken out and wrapped around the wounded youth. But the prince's cuts only burned the more, and his sufferings became still more unbearable. When he saw that he was in a bad way, he sent for a priest that he might relieve his heart before he died and give him the sacrament. But Iliane, she was not idle. She went to the priest, offered him a large sum of money, and induced him to let her go to the palace in his place. So Iliane arrived at the court disguised as a priest. When she approached the prince's bed, he was at the point of death. There were scarcely three breaths left in him. My son, said the false priest, Iliane, you have summoned me to confess your sins to me. Think of the hour of death and tell me all you have on your heart. Are you at variance with anyone? Yes or no? With no one, replied the prince, except Iliane, the youngest daughter of the emperor, our neighbor. And I hate her out of love and longing, he continued. If I should not die but recover, I will ask the emperor for her hand in marriage. And if I don't kill her the first night, she will be my faithful wife, as according to the law. Iliane heard these words, said a few in reply, and then went home. Here she soon understood why her sisters were wailing and lamenting for they had heard that the emperor was returning home from the great war. You ought to rejoice, said Iliane, when you hear that our kind father is coming home safe and well. We should rejoice, replied the sisters, if our flowers had not withered, our apples had not rotted, and our birds had not stopped singing. But now we have reason to cry. When Iliane heard these words, she went to her room, saw the flower sprinkled with dew, the bird hungry, and the apple looking as if it wanted to say, Eat me, little sister. So to help her dear sisters, she gave the flower to one and the bird to another, keeping only the beautiful apple for herself. So they waited for the arrival of the emperor, who was very stern in his commands. When the monarch reached home, he approached his oldest daughter and asked for the flower, the bird, and the apple. She showed him nothing but the flower, and even that was half-withered. The emperor said nothing, but went to his second daughter. She showed him only the little bird, and that too looked drooping. Again, the emperor did not speak, but silently went up to his youngest daughter, clever Iliane. When the emperor saw the apple on Iliane's chest of drawers, he could have almost devoured it with his eyes. It was so beautiful. Where did you put the flower, and what have you done with the bird? he asked Iliane. Iliane did not answer, but hurried to her sisters, and brought back a fresh flower and a merry little bird. May you prosper, my little daughter, said the emperor. I see now that you have kept faith with me. From Iliane, the emperor went to his second daughter, and then to the eldest one. When he questioned them about the three things he had trusted to the care, they hastily brought Iliane's flower, bird, and apple. But, as God permits no falsehood to succeed, in their hands the flower withered, the bird moped, and only the apple remained fresh, rosy-cheeked, and eatable. When the emperor saw this, he understood everything, and ordered the two older princesses to be buried to their breasts in the earth, and left there that they might be an example of the severity of an imperial punishment. But Iliane, he praised, kissed, spoke to her in kind, fatherly words, and said, May you have much happiness, my child, for you have been faithful to your duty. After the neighboring emperor's son had recovered, he mounted his horse and set off to ask Iliane to be his wife. 
The old emperor, Eliane's father, after hearing for what purpose the prince had come, said to him kindly, Go and ask Eliane, my son and hero. Whatever she wishes shall, with God's help, be done. Eliane said nothing, but permitted the prince to kiss her. The emperor instantly understood the whole matter and said, My dear children, I see that you ought to be husband and wife. May it prove for your good. It was not long before Iliane married the bold, handsome, heroic youth. The wedding was so magnificent that the tidings of it spread through seven countries. Yes, indeed. But Iliane had not forgotten the evil the prince had in his mind. She knew that he would try some trick upon her the first night after their marriage. So she ordered a sugar doll to be made exactly the same shape as she was, with face, eyes, lips, and figure precisely like Iliane's. When it was finished, she hid it in the bed where she ought to sleep that night. In the evening, when the relatives and friends had gone to rest and Iliane too had been asleep, the prince said to his bride, Dear Iliane, wait a little while, I'll come back directly. Then he left the room. Iliane did not hesitate long, but jumped out of bed, left the sugar doll in her place, and hid behind a curtain at the head of the bed. She had barely concealed herself when the prince returned to the chamber with a sharp sword in his hand. Tell me now, dear Iliane, he said, did you throw me into the cellar? Yes, I did, said Iliane behind the curtain. The prince dealt one blow with the sword on the doll's breast. Did you drive me out of the country with scorn and mockery? He asked again. Yes, I did, said Iliane. The prince cut the doll across her face. Did you empty my dishes of food? Asked the prince the third time. Yes, I did, said Iliane. The prince slashed the doll from head to foot. Did you pour out my wine? Was the prince's fourth question. Yes. I did, said Iliane. The prince cut the figure once across. Iliane began to breathe heavily, as if in the agony of death. Did you throw me among the knives? He asked for the fifth and last question. Yes, I did, said Iliane. The prince now thrust his sword into the figure's heart, slashed and hacked it in all directions with all of his strength, till the tears ran down in streams. As dawn approached, he began to sob bitterly. Suddenly, a bit of sugar popped into his mouth. Ah, uh, Iliane, you were sweet in life and remain sweet even in death, he said, weeping still more violently. Sweet indeed, said Iliane, coming up from behind the curtain. But from this hour forth, I will be a hundred thousand times sweeter. The prince seemed fairly petrified with delight when he saw Iliane safe and well. He clasped her in his arms, and for many years they lived joyously and ruled the land in peace and happiness. And that is the tale of Clever Iliane from Romanian folklore. Thank you for listening to our story. If you enjoyed it, we recommend taking a look at our Patreon page as noted in the description below. You can earn great rewards while also supporting us to keep these stories alive for future generations to come. Also remember to subscribe to us on your podcast application and leave us a five-star rating if you enjoyed this story. A special thank you to Kat for their support this month. Without your contribution, we wouldn't be able to continue these stories, and we truly appreciate it. Visit thescaldcircle.com to stay up to date with all of our current events, news, and much more. Not only that... But you can also visit our story archive of every tale we have told. It's sorted by origin and region for the convenience of your listening pleasure. Thank you for listening to our story. Don't forget, this episode is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. While this story is over, you can still visit audibletrial.com slash the scald circle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. Let us know what you've listened to recently on Audible via our Facebook page. We're always looking for new recommendations.